it's good to see everyone tonight after another two-week break. I bet the people out there in YouTube land think we're always taking two-week breaks, right? <laughs> but I uh, had a little traveling to do and I needed a little time off, so I've enjoyed it. And uh, I want to tonight finish up this series on the language of the blood. I want to go back and take a little bit out of each message that we have done just to kind of reiterate some things and bring things back to your remembrance. And then we're going to get into a new series of teachings that um, the Lord's been laying on my heart. I put a couple Facebook posts on, and I'm just going to call it toxic texts. We're going to look at some toxic texts where Jesus and Paul redefine some scriptures for us in order to remove people's awareness from violence and retribution and vengeance and so forth. And they would go back and they would quote these scriptures, especially Paul the Apostle. Now, we're familiar with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, how he would say, you know, they say this, but I say the other. They say, you know, love your uh, friends, but hate your enemies, but I say love your enemies and so forth. So we've been familiar with that. But some of the scriptures that Paul the Apostle used, I found out that in some verses of scripture that he quoted, especially in Romans, he would quote things from the Old Testament and leave out two or three sentences. Wow. And they were sentences that had to do with violence and God not answering prayer and uh, retribution and vengeance and so forth. And he would just take whole sentences out in order to show people that we need to interpret the scriptures, not only the new but even the old, from the lens of what Jesus revealed about the Father which was that he was only love. Amen. He's only love, not about retribution, not about vengeance. And, of course, we know in Romans that when Paul talked about, and he quoted the scripture from the Old Testament, vengeance is mine, I shall repay, he showed us then how vengeance looked. Mm -hmm. And how did it look? I think we brought that scripture out here. How did it look? Uh, if your brother is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him to drink. And thereby you're heaping coals of love, fire, the fire of God's word upon his head. And so we need to interpret the scriptures through what Jesus came in his incarnation and revealed about the Father, that he is nothing but love. People say, well, he's just. And I say, yes to that, he's just love. Amen. He's just love. And you'll never find scriptures that testify to the fact that that he is just alone, meaning that he's going to make everything right in a legalistic, just manner. But you'll always see the word justice or just included and connected with long-suffering and grace and love and mercy and so forth. And so we've had a God, and I think this is so important, the religious system has had a God of retribution. And as I say, the God that people worship is what they act like. Mm -hmm. You know, if we see a God of vengeance and anger and retribution, that's what comes out of us because we're one in him. And you always act like the person you believe yourself to be. Well, you always act like the God that you worship as well. And so it's very important that we began to see the God who has always been loved, never been anything except love. And so... When you read scriptures in the Old Testament that on the surface seem like God did certain things as killing and telling others to kill, we need to look at those through the lens of what Jesus revealed about the Father. Now, uh, something came to me today, and I put it on my Facebook post, and it's this. In order for the Word of God to be inspired to us, and I believe the Word is inspired, if we see and interpret it, through the Spirit. Amen. If we see the Spirit of the Word rather than the letter of the Word, then it's inspired to us. But not every word in Scripture is inspired. And we looked at that before, how that the Greek, you know, doesn't say every word is inspired or God breathed. It says every word that is God breathed is the inspired Word of God. So that's a whole different uh, way to look at that there. So what I want to do is I want to go back tonight, as I said, and share a little bit out of each of the messages that we have had. This is the fourth message. We will continue on this theme, but we're just going to entitle it differently. And we're going to still talk about no penal substitution. We're still going to talk about how we were always forgiven and more than forgiven. God was never offended, so he doesn't have a propensity or a need to have to forgive us. 
But uh, the key for us to understand that the Father never needed blood are the four Greek words that we talked about. And if you remember those four Greek words, the first one was charismaia, which is talking about a forgiveness that wasn't earned, it wasn't merited, there was nothing we did to get it. Because it, and how could we have done something to get it? It was from before the foundation. 2 Timothy 1, 9, Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 talk about the fact that we were chosen, we were called, we were saved, we were made blameless when from before the foundation. Now, certainly, as we shared, we receive that in order to experience it in life. But the word receive means to take into oneself that which has always been ours. So either way, it's just for us to walk in it. But we need to realize that we were always forgiven and more than that since the Father wasn't ever offended. But you see, we needed to see those words forgive and forgiveness because, you know, he always relates to us at the level that we're at. And so the words forgiveness there concerning our personal forgiveness are simply there because, uh, you know, at the beginning, we just related to words like that. But now that we're seeing something greater, that he never was offended, you know, then forgiveness doesn't even come into the picture, really. See? Because it's something more than him even just forgiving us. He was never offended by us. So we'll really understand that our Father never needed blood, and we'll really understand no penal substitution when we understand the four Greek words that we were looking at. Number one was charismai. We were always forgiven. And then we looked at three Greek words that begin with an A, aphemiae, aphesis, and apollio. And each of those mean, in the Greek, they simply mean freedom and liberty from. And we talked about the fact that we can be forgiven of, but we can still be in bondage to Amen. things, habits and different things, you know, in our lives that, you know, we maybe don't have complete victory in yet. And so in order for us to understand that our Father never needed blood, we need to understand those four Greek words. Again, the three A words simply speak to us of forgiveness from, whereas charismaia speak to us as forgiveness of, how that we were always forgiven by the Father. So when you tell people, as we shared in our first message, that our Father never needed the blood to forgive us, <clears throat> one of the first things that they will say, they will quote from Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And they, 99 and 9 tenths percent of the time, they'll misquote it, and they'll say, well, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, and the words of sin are not there. And it's not even talking about our personal forgiveness. But it is talking about something that has to do with the law. Now, I gave you ten different realities concerning Hebrews chapter 9. If you recall in the first message, we talked about the fact in Hebrews chapter 9, the first point is the writer of Hebrews here in this chapter is simply contrasting Jesus and Moses. And when you get further on down beyond verse 22, it begins to talk about uh, Jesus and the blood and so forth. And he comes a second time without sin and to salvation and so forth. And so number one, point number one, we found out in Hebrews chapter 9, the writer is simply contrasting Jesus and Moses. And he wasn't doing that by supporting the law of Moses. He wasn't doing that whatsoever in support of the law of Moses or the pagan idea of the killing of animals. That's where a lot of the sacrificial animal killing came from. It was from their mythology, from their mythological ideas that were carried over, most of them, from Egypt. And we know that the scripture talks about Molech and Ashroth and Zeus, and it lists some of these false gods. And they were even at the point where they, at times, were offering human sacrifices, and I believe that the Father, I believe God allowed then Moses to set up the sacrificial animal system in order to wean them away a little bit from the human sacrifices. But it never was God's will. The shedding of blood never was God's will. So when people quote Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 and say, well, you know, if God did not need blood, what does it mean where it says without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sin? What they're doing is not realizing that the shedding of blood that it's talking about there 
has nothing to do with our personal forgiveness, but it has to do with the law. It had to do with the institution of the Old Covenant, with the initiation of the Old Covenant. It had to do with the cleansing of the tabernacle and all the utensils. It had to do with all of that. It had nothing to do whatsoever. And it wasn't comparing Moses and the animal sacrifices with Jesus. It wasn't comparing, making that comparison in support of the sacrificial system whatsoever. Number two, the second point that we looked at from Hebrews 9.22 was that the writer in verse 22 stated that almost all things were purified with the blood. Now, these people in the Old Covenant kind of had almost, you could say, a fetish for cleansing things, kind of like we use Lysol. Well, I don't use it, but, you know, it's toxic, but some people use Lysol today. Uh, you know, and they're always, you know, trying to get rid of germs. And the people in the Old Testament were always trying to clean things up. It was a law. They had the law of cleansing. And so, number two, the second point there in verse 22, the writer was stating that almost all things were purified with blood. And we looked at that, and we saw that there were other ways that purification was done. It wasn't always with blood. Sometimes it was done with blood, but it was done with a flour, offering a flour, the washing of water, or the burning of flour. It was by giving money. It was by releasing an animal into the wild. There were a number of ways that they would cleanse things. But notice there in verse 22 of Hebrews 9, the writer says, almost all things. That gives a little leeway there. Almost all things were cleansed with blood. So we looked at that and we saw that that in no way had anything to do with our personal forgiveness from the Father because the Father never needed any blood to forgive us. And if we'll understand those things, it'll be real easy for us to understand no penal substitution. It would be real easy for us to understand why that the Father never needed blood to forgive us. Number three, the third point we looked at from Hebrews 9.22 is again that it's not even about sin, but it's about the Old Covenant. As I said, it's about the cleansing of the temple and the utensils and the dedication and the initiation of the Mosaic Covenant. In fact, the author in Hebrews 9 was not giving a general principle of how one receives forgiveness, but instead he was referring to how Moses had initiated the law and how that it was initiated and it was inaugurated through the killing of animals. And God had nothing to do with that. There are many scriptures in the Old Testament that say he wasn't pleased with animal sacrifices. He wasn't into killing. You know, so many people think, well, you know, when Adam said that he was naked and he was unclothed and so forth, that God went out and killed an animal to clothe them with skin, with animal skin. But you know what it literally says? Linen tunics has nothing to do with an animal being killed. God killed no animal. God was never into killing. In fact, the first sacrifice that we see was offered by Noah after the flood. And we'll talk about that perhaps a little bit later. Number four, Hebrews chapter 22 also states very clearly that the shedding of blood had to do according to one thing and one thing alone, and that was the law. Moses commanded it. It doesn't say anything about God commanding that they purify this, that, and the other, that they offer sacrifices or shed the, you know, the blood of bulls and goats. God never ordered that. It was all by Moses. In fact, John 1, 17 tells us there that the law came by Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The word but is not really in the original. Because if it would say the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, it's almost connecting. But is a conjunction connecting two ideas. And it's almost, and a lot of people in religion have done this, like they have said, well, the shedding of the blood was a shadow and it was a type for Jesus' shedding of blood. No, it wasn't. God was not into it. It was not a type and a shadow in the way that we have thought and the way we have taught that it was a type and a shadow until Jesus Christ would come and shed his blood. How could it be? God never wanted the animal sacrifice. God never wanted the shed blood of Jesus. So how could it have been a setup for what would happen then when God would bring Jesus, have him shed his blood to appease his anger toward us. Number five, the fifth point we looked at is shed blood never brought forgiveness. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4, it says there, the author points out, that it was impossible.
possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Even though it was promised, guess what? The law could not fulfill the promise that was given that it would take away or even cover sin. It was in their mind because what Moses told them that if they would shed a sacrificial animal, it would cover their sin. How could it cover their sin? It was in their mind that it covered their sin. And this is why David, after he had sinned with Bathsheba, he went before the father and he said, Father, I know you don't want me to offer a sacrifice. What you want is a pure heart and a contrite heart. That's what you want from me. Otherwise, I'd offer you a sacrifice. But I know you don't want that. And so I won't offer you a sacrifice because that is not your purpose and your plan. Your plan is for people to have a heart, a contrite heart, if they have missed the mark. So what we must understand is we have simply been forgiven from before the foundation. In fact, we know and we read scripture that even Jesus forgave people before he went to the cross. Jesus healed people before he went to the cross. Jesus extended grace to people before he went to the cross. Even Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So grace was not something that Jesus activated when he went to the cross. What did the cross do? It didn't activate anything. What it did it was it revealed something. It revealed the reality of the truth that was always the truth of it. It revealed our salvation. It revealed forgiveness. It revealed all of these things that we now are partaking of. Thank you, dear. Number six, the sixth point is Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 shows us the reality that it was not about the forgiveness of sins because the words of sins are not at the end of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. So it had nothing to do with our sin. It had nothing to do with our mistaken identity or the resultant sins of the flesh that would come out of having a mistaken identity. Now, I shared with you how if you read on in Hebrews chapter 9 and you get to verse 26, it tells us there and it mentions sin, but it only mentions sin in reference to Jesus putting away sin, not in reference to him forgiving sin. Say that again. Verse 26, Hebrews 9, 26 uses the word sin there, but not in reference to Jesus forgiving sin, because we were forgiven from before the foundation, but simply in reference to him putting away. Now, how did he put away sin? When Jesus went to the cross, how did he put away sin? He put it away. What does the resurrection do? The, the cross, the blood, the, the death, the crucifixion. What did it do? It exposed our mistaken identity. It exposed sacred violence, which is an oxymoron, but I'm going to use that for the sake of reference here. It exposed the lies of religion, but his resurrection revealed the truth. And in that sense, when the truth is revealed, sin, mistaken identity, and what comes out of that is put away. Mm -hmm. See, that's the ephesus. That's the ephemia, or that's the apollo. What is it? It's freedom, not just not just forgiveness of, but it's freedom from anything that would bind us. There's a difference between forgiveness of and then freedom from those things. And we, the church, really needs to have the awareness of our freedom from the fact that God ever needed blood to forgive us. And when we have that reality, we'll realize we were always forgiven and more. He was never offended. That's the good news of the gospel. And as we begin to digest that and assimilate that, as that begins to percolate within us and the Spirit quickens it, it's going to cause us to walk in a whole new light and a whole new experience in Him. Number seven, the seventh one we looked at from Hebrews 9.22, we found out that it's not about forgiveness of anything, but it's about remission, which is the Greek word of thesis, again, that means to stand away or, or to send away, excuse me, to send away. And in this case, that word remission there, meaning a thesis or being the Greek word of thesis, means to send away anything that they consider to be unclean concerning the tabernacle or its utensils. Number eight, the eighth thing we looked at is that the word remission also has to do with the release of the Old Covenant 
or the inauguration of the Mosaic Law. Moses believed that he needed to slay an animal and shed some blood for the remission or the sending away or the release of the Old Covenant and the inauguration of that Old Covenant. He needed to send some things away. He needed to cleanse some things in order for that Old Covenant to become initiated and inaugurated. Number nine, the ninth thing we saw was that it also has to do with the release of the children of Israel from their bondage in Egypt. It represented the death of the Israelites from their former life of bondage in Egypt. And it occurred when the water and the blood, if you read all of that chapter 9 of Hebrews, it occurred when the water and the blood was sprinkled upon the covenant, the book of the covenant, and sprinkled upon the people. And then number 10, the last one we looked at, in the last part of chapter 9 there, he talks about Jesus and we see that the blood of Jesus was not for forgiveness. It was not for forgiveness, but as verse 26 declares, it was the putting away of mistaken identity by the sacrifice of himself because it exposed the lie of religion. His resurrection revealed the truth, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So that's what Hebrews chapter 9 is all about. So the next time you tell someone that God didn't need the blood to forgive you, and they quote, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, you can tell them, well, that's not what that verse is talking about whatsoever. In fact, it doesn't even have the words of sin on the end. So you see, we've been hoodwinked and bamboozled by a whole lot of lies of religion, and now we're beginning to wake up to the reality of the truth. And what is that going to do for us? It's going to cause us to walk in the full experience and to bear fruit that remains. To me, all of these truths are indicative of a people that walk in the awareness of them, quickened by the Spirit, and their experience becomes fruit that remains. And that's what we need. That's what the whole creation is looking for. They're looking for the manifestation of the sons of God in the earth, a people who are not one way one day and another way another day, but a people who are bearing fruit that remains, a people that are loving. And when I talk about fruit that remains, that's number one on the list. A people that are loving, a people that are long-suffering, a people that are patient and a people that are kind. For too long, church people have been mean, ugly, people that have condemned people to an eternal hell and have been very judgmental well honey those days are over Amen. it's time for us to not only know that we have been forgiven of from before the foundation but we need to be liberated from all of those things that have bound us whether it's not walking in the fruit of the spirit no matter what it is we need to be released from the bondage of those things and i know of no other truths that will reveal that than these truths because what does it reveal it reveals the love of our father it reveals the love of our father as nothing else number two the second message then that i brought forth on this series on the language of the blood we discussed the principle of first mention and i shared with you how when you see the word sin mentioned the first time any you know word that you see mentioned the first time the principle of first mention what is that telling us? It is simply telling us that the way it's used the first time is going to carry through all the way throughout the scriptures and pretty much have the same meaning and the same connotation. So the first time you see sin used, it was in relationship to sin lying at the door where Cain was concerned when he was tempted to kill his brother. And then when you see the word blood used the first time, it is associated with the violence that was in Cain's heart to take his brother out. And we talked about the, the blood of Abel crying out for vengeance, but the blood of Jesus crying out for mercy and grace. And then we looked at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24, which tells us there that the blood of Jesus speaks of better things. It's a better word than that of Abel. And then we read in Romans chapter 12, and I quoted this earlier tonight when we began, in Romans 12, 19 and 20, where Paul there was stating, vengeance is mine, I will repay. We looked at how that looks. And how did that vengeance look? Well, if your brother's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. And in doing that, you are heaping coals of fire 
upon his head. So what type of vengeance is that? When you see your brother hungry and you feed him or thirsty and you give him drink, what kind of vengeance is that? It's not retributive vengeance, that's for sure. It is restorative vengeance. It's really the word should have been translated vindication. Vindication. It's restorative vindication. We love people. We help people as the Spirit leads us and so forth. Then we looked at how the violence progressed in the Old Testament, beginning with Cain, and then went to Lamech in Genesis chapter 4, and then on in Genesis chapter 6 concerning the flood. And we saw that the first actual animal sacrifice was offered up after the flood by Noah. We then looked at Matthew 23 where it's recorded that sacred violence was committed and it talks there about the prophet Zechariah and righteous Abel being killed. And then we talked about Saul, the man Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, how he was a hater of Christians. He was involved in scapegoating. He was involved in sacred, if you will, violence or religious violence. He ran around and he killed people. He held death warrants for, for Stephen that was stoned. What was that? All of that was that religious violence that began with Cain. And what happened was the violence began to build and get greater and greater. And as a result, then, I believe that is when God then allowed Moses to kind of bring the law to build a fence around some of that. And, you know, the scripture talks about the law being an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We'll talk about that in our next series. But you know what? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth really was a good thing. Because Lamech, Lamech wanted to take seven people out. We know that Cain really wanted to take a couple people out. And so what he was saying, what Moses was saying, only one eye for an eye. And we'll talk about that later. They were limiting people. He was limiting people because the violence had gotten so great that Moses had to set up some boundaries so the people wouldn't go as crazy, wild with their violence. And again, we'll talk about that the next time. But we talked about Saul, who later became Paul, who was, you know, he killed Christians. Why? Because of the violence that was in his heart. And then we talked about Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus then begins to inaugurate and institute the new covenant. And he began to serve the bread and the wine. And in Matthew 26, 27, and 28, he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And drink, this is my blood. And then he said, it's shed for the remission of sins. And that was really the initiation and the inauguration of the new covenant. It was not when Jesus was taken to the cross by the Romans and by the religious Jewish people. That was not, his shedding of blood was not the inauguration of the new covenant. It was right here in Matthew chapter 26 before he ever went to the cross. This is when he really instituted the new covenant. And notice at the end of that verse, he said, take this is my body and this is my blood, eat and drink and so forth, for the remission of sin. Again, it's not the forgiveness of sin. It's the Greek word of pieces. And it means that you can be freed from the bondage of anything that you're bound to. And especially the lie of sacred violence, especially the lie of religious violence, especially the lie that God needed blood in order to forgive you. So what is he saying here for the remission of sin? He's saying, when I go to the cross and when I shed my blood and when I am raised again, that's going to reveal the truth unto you. And when the truth is revealed unto you, you're going to be free from anything that you're in bondage to. See, because you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. See, it's not truth that makes us free. It's the knowing of the truth. And that's why the resurrection of Jesus is so important, because what did it do? It did activate, but it revealed the truth unto us. His blood exposed the lies, the lie of mistaken identity, the lie of religious violence, the lie that God needed blood to forgive us. The shed blood exposed that, but the resurrection revealed the truth then that brings about the Ephesus and the Apollo and the Ephemii. In other words, the freedom from anything that would bind us. Again, it's one thing to be forgiven of, but it's another thing to be made free from right, sure those is. things. And then in our next session, 
we looked at about eight or nine, and this was the last YouTube presentation we made, we looked at about eight or nine different verses of Scripture that connected words like redemption and blood and forgiveness together. And we found out, once again, that the key in understanding these verses was simply to see the difference between those four Greek words that I gave you, to see the difference between charismai, ephesus, ephemiae, and apollio. And once we see the difference, when we will just do a little word study, when we see redemption and blood and forgiveness in one or two verses of Scripture, if we'll just look up those words and see what it's talking about, it'll make all the difference to us. See, so just understanding those four Greek words will make all the difference between us understanding that the Father never needed the blood. That we were forgiven, 2 Timothy 1, 9, we were called, we were chosen, made holy, we were forgiven from before time ever began. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4, there again, it says we were forgiven, we were made holy, we were called. In so many words, it says it there, from before time ever began, from eternity. Isn't that amazing to realize we came here forgiven? Hello? Isn't it amazing to know we came here saved? <gasps> what? <laughs> we came here redeemed. We came here reconciled. And I shared with you all those words. The suffix re means again. What does it mean? What is it saying to us? Well, when we came here, we were saved and redeemed and won and reconciled and all of that. He never imputed, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, never imputed anything against us. But the problem was religion got a hold of us, we got amnesia, and we forgot. So the cross then, the incarnation, exposes and then reveals the truth to us that we had forgotten. So re means again, redeemed. We had again, we needed again to be reminded that he always deemed us as holy and saved and righteous and one. Amen. We needed to be reconciled. Re means again. We needed to be reminded again that we were always conciliated to the Father. We were always one. We were always reconciled, always redeemed, always saved. And the first question religious people say, well, don't we need to receive that? Not to activate it, but to experience it. Just to experience it. Because receive, again, means to take into oneself that which has always been ours. And see, that's a biggie that we have not understood. We have not understood that from the foundation of the world, from before time ever began, we came here one, we came here holy, we came here complete. You know, uh, there's a lady, a very famous star, uh, I think, what is her name, Gifford? You know her name? Um, what is Kathy her name? Lee. Yes, Kathleen. Is, she's the one that wrote the book, and she found out that peace, shalom, doesn't mean what we thought it means. You know, we, we've had some understanding, and really it's not correct, even in the Strong's Concordance, but it means complete. Shalom means complete. We've thought it meant just peace. It means complete. So nothing broken, nothing missing. That's how we came, complete. We came here complete. I guess she wrote a book on that, and she came, you know, to the understanding that peace, shalom, means more than just peace, but it means complete, nothing missing and nothing broken. So that's what we were looked at. Now, what I want to do is I want to answer some questions that were asked. Uh, the one person that asked this one question is not here tonight, so perhaps they'll listen to the YouTube presentation. And then down in Portland, we had another question that was asked. And the first question that was asked uh, down in Portland was, what are we going to do with the scripture in Revelation 13 and verse 8? In fact, you can turn there if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along. And then there was one that was here in this meeting in Fort Wayne that asked about Abraham walking through the pieces of the, of the slain animal in Genesis chapter 15. So I want to answer those questions in closing here tonight. And then I want to look at some natural qualifications or some natural functions, I should say, of our natural blood. And as I'm reading these natural functions of our natural blood, because how many know as in the natural, so in the spiritual... I want you to ask your, uh, uh, yourself a question. Does that have anything to do with forgiveness? Because as of the natural, so in the spiritual. 
So the functions of my natural blood really don't have anything with my forgiveness, have anything to do with my forgiveness, but it has to do with my being free from something. We'll talk about that in the end. But look at Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. And people use this all the time. They'll, and they, again, they misquote the scripture. And this scripture in Revelation 13, 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now notice it does not say, it doesn't word it like Second Peter uh, or Second Timothy 1, 9. It doesn't word it like Ephesians 1, 3, and 4, where it says before the foundation. It's talking about the Lamb slain from the foundation. But people will say, well, what are you going to do if you're talking no penal substitution and, uh, you know, God charismized us from before time ever began, from before the foundation, what are you going to do? If God wasn't in the slaying of the blood, then what are you going to do with this scripture here in Revelation 13, 8 that talks about the lamb slain from the foundation? Notice the word before is not there. So this has to mean something else. If the word, listen, if we added the word before, we would be inferring penal substitution. Mm -hmm. If it was true that the lamb was slain from before, then that would mean God was involved in that. Mm. And it would be, you know, inferring penal substitution, which would mean, yes, the lamb was slain from before the foundation in the mind of God, and so God was a peace from before. That's what they say about this verse. But that's not what it's talking about. Let me just give you a little definition here. The word foundation here in Revelation 13a means in the Greek conception. Now, let me say it this way. Man was made in God's image and after his likeness, and he was conceived in the mind of the Father. And he was brought forth in, in the Father's in God's image and likeness. So let me ask you this question. Could, could the lamb that was slain refer to the image of God that Adam was brought forth as? After all, Adam was a son of God. So could the lamb that was slain refer to the image of God that Adam was brought forth as? Could it be that Adam slew something in his awareness that the father had conceived in his mind to make Adam after his image and after his likeness? Could it be? Now, the very interesting thing is when you study in Revelation, you see that numerous times the word lamb is lamakin. And it's a corporate lamekin company. Hello. So here where it talks about the lamb slain from the foundation, foundation is conception, it was conceived in the mind of God to make man in his image after his likeness. But this word lamb here in Revelation is the word lamekin as well. So could it be talking about, since it's talking about lamekin, the people, could it be that the lamb slain from the foundation is talking about something that Adam did when he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He slew the awareness of being in the image and in the likeness of God. Could that be what it's referring to? Well, I think it is because, listen, since God did not need blood to be appeased, and since it does not say the lamb slain from before the foundation then it has to be something else that God the Father was involved with here in Revelation 13 and verse 8. Now, we know that Isaiah 53, 4 states that we did esteem him smitten and stricken of God. We did. We esteemed him. We esteemed Jesus Christ smitten and stricken of God that God did it. That God was the one that sent him to the cross. But God was not the one that sent him to the cross. Even though man put him on the cross, yes, Jesus willingly laid down his life, but he laid down his life turning the other cheek. He laid down his life not reviling. When they accused him, he, he never argued back. He revealed the love of the Father. So what am I saying? I'm simply saying that we are the ones, mankind, beginning with Adam is the one, that slew the awareness of the image and the likeness of the Father within him. And then he hides, and then God comes to him and said, Who told you you're naked? What was he trying to do? 
I believe he was trying to clothe Adam with a different awareness. Mm -hmm. And it could be that the linen tunic that it's talking about could be that the father was trying, because clothing speaks of awareness. It could be that what that saying where it says that he clothed them with skins or coats or linen tunics, it could be that when the father said, who told you that, Adam? But he was clothing Adam and the woman with a different awareness. Now, I don't have that set in stone in my understanding yet, but could it be that that's the truth? So back to what it says here in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, the lamb slain from the foundation. Could it be that what that is talking about is since Adam was conceived in the mind of God and then brought forth in his image after his likeness, and since God was not involved in the lamb slain from before, since it doesn't use the word before, could it be that this is referring to Adam slaying something in his own awareness? especially since it uses the word lambkin and not just one specific lamb. Hello. That's what I think it's talking about. So those who, you know, will ask the question, well, what about, you know, Revelation 13, 8 that says the lamb was slain from before the foundation? First of all, as I said, they misinterpret that again or misquote that again because it was the lamb slain from the foundation. Now, we have scripture in Isaiah 11 and verse 6 that says that the wolf is going to feed with the lamb and they're going to lie down together. And I don't think that that's talking about in the kingdom of God that the literal animals, the lion and the lamb or the wolf and the lamb, are going to play together and feed together and lie down together. You know what I think it's talking about? I think it's talking about within a people. Mm -hmm. I think it's talking about, you know, the lamb nature, you know, the scripture says we're to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. I think it's talking about within us, as we understand this truth, within us, you see, that wolf and the lamb are going to feed together. That tendency to be, you know, like a wolf or like a lion. And that can be either on a good side or even on a negative side. We can be bold as a lion, but know when to be as gentle as a lamb. So just like the wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. We have discernment. We know when to allow the boldness out, and we know when to be gentle with people. See, and I think that's what it's talking about here in Isaiah chapter 11 and also Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 25. All of that is happening within us. So Revelation 13, 8, I believe, is talking about something that was slain in the mind or specifically the awareness of Adam who was in the image, who was conceived, foundation means conception, who was conceived in the mind of God and then brought forth in the Father's image and likeness. He didn't guard his heart. And as a result, he didn't keep the garden. And as a result, he slew that lamb nature or that lamb awareness. Then it appeared like he slew the lamb nature. It really was just the awareness that he slew because it all happened in the awareness. Then it appeared that he slew a lamb nature. See, we never came here with an Adamic identity or sinful nature, but you know what? It looks like we did. When the prodigal, for example, left the father, that was just something happening within his awareness. But when he ended up in the pig pen, it appeared that he had a sinful nature. It appeared that he took on a different identity, but he never did. The father was always waiting there to receive his son unto himself. Same way with the, the sheep that went missing. It didn't become a goat. It didn't change in its nature. It looked like it. It didn't change in its identity. The coin that was covered over with dirt, the inscription didn't change. The value did not change, even though it appeared like it. See, there's times that we appear as though we have a sinful nature or an Adamic identity because you'll always act like the person you believe yourself to be. So these truths, you know, are great truths for us to understand. Now, let me look at the other one in Genesis chapter 15. The last one, the last question that was asked here was uh, about Abraham slaying the animals and then walking through the different pieces of the animals. And then it says that he fell into a trance. And then what happens, it says that the flaming furnace, which represents the father, began to walk through those animals. Now, the issue is not the animals. God was never for the animals. It was just simply the father meeting Abraham at the level that he was at. And what he was saying through this, this experience and this scenario was, if I do not keep my promise to you, Abraham, I have to die like these 
animals had to die. Like these animals died that you slew. That's all that that is saying. It is not, it is not that the father was for sacrifice and the shedding of blood. It wasn't that at all. He was simply meeting Abraham where he was. And he was simply saying, by him as the flaming furnace, once Abraham fell into the trance after he'd walked through those pieces of animals, it was simply God walking, doing the same and walking through and simply saying, as surely as I live or as truly as I live, Abraham, this is going to be fulfilled. In other words, if I don't fulfill, if my promise isn't fulfilled to you, I have to die just like these animals did. That's all that was going on there. It was not The issue was not the animals or the sacrifices or the shedding of the blood of these animals. It wasn't about that. It was simply about God performing to Abraham what God had promised unto him. And you know, they were always making covenants back then, blood covenants and, you know, sharing their blood and rubbing their blood together and so forth. But I believe when Jesus shared with the disciples the Last Supper in Matthew chapter 26, what was happening there is the new covenant was initiated, but it was something that was initiated way back in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, when God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He blessed them and said, have dominion. To me, that was the beginning of the new covenant. Now, all of these other covenants came and went, but it was man's doing. It was not God. Just God allowed it because things were in a mess and they needed little boundaries and they needed a fence built around them to try to stop some of their violence. But I believe that the new covenant that was initiated in Matthew chapter 26 when Jesus said, this is my blood and this is my body. Eat it and drink it. And you'll have the remission or the freedom from any bondage in your life because the resurrection will reveal the truth to you that will make you free. I believe he was really reinstituting, I'm going to say it that way, rededicating, reinaugurating that which God had said in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27. That's the way I believe it. That's the way I'm beginning to see it. He never, our Father never left what he said in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27. That was always his purpose and always his plan. He made mankind in his image after his likeness. He blessed them and he gave man dominion. And he said, rule, have dominion. That was his plan from the very beginning. Man went through all kind of rigmaroles and all kind of covenants and all kind of shedding of blood. And God never was for any of that. He allowed that, yes, because that's where man was. But his main purpose, his number one purpose was Genesis chapter 1. And so when Jesus was sharing the Last Supper, he was just re-inaugurating what the Father had done and what he had said in Genesis chapter 1. Now, let me give you some functions of the blood. And as I said, ask yourself this question as I go through these. And I'm going to close with this. There are many functions of our natural physical blood. And as I read some of these functions, ask yourself, does that have anything to do with me being forgiven? Or does it have anything to do with the Father never ever being offended with me to begin with? Or does it have to do with me being free from something and liberated from something? Let me go down this list. Red blood cells are made in the bone marrow. Well, we know that. And there's a reason for that. There are Five to six million red blood cells per cubic millimeter in man and four to five million cubic millimeters in women. Let me read that again. There are five to six million red blood cells per cubic millimeter in man and four to five million in the woman. That's a lot. They last about 120 days before they wear out. We produce about 3,000 new blood cells per second. Think of that. 3,000 new blood cells per second. That's a lot. Our blood carries oxygen to our lungs. It feeds our leg muscles with the proteins needed. It delivers hormones to the digestive organs to trigger the release of digestive enzymes. It fights all kinds of infections. Amen. 
It feeds our brain the right amount of blood sugar for mental activity. That's our natural blood. It transports toxins from our food out of the digestive tract to the liver. Our natural blood. I don't hear anything about forgiveness there. But I hear a lot, a whole lot about freedom from something. Freedom from keeling over and dying. Freedom from being unconscious. Freedom from infection disease. and disease. Yeah. It carries white cells to areas of all kinds of inflammation, if that's in our body. It provides enough blood pressure to the brain to maintain consciousness. So the reason I'm physically conscious tonight and you're physically conscious tonight is because it is providing our blood that's flowing through the veins of our body is providing enough blood pressure to the brain to keep us consciously awake. It carries thyroxin hormone from the thyroid gland to each cell to maintain proper body temperature. It controls and regulates our body temperature. That's our natural blood. Plus it does all kind of other things. You could go on and on with all of the things, all of the functions of our natural blood. Why? To liberate us from something. To free us from something. I didn't hear any forgiveness. I didn't hear any charisma. But I heard on a natural level a femiae, a thesis, and a polio. That's what I heard. I heard a sending away. I heard a liberation from. I heard a cleansing from. Now, the scripture says, as in the natural, so in the spiritual. So even though the blood that flows through our veins tonight has nothing whatsoever to do with charisma in the natural or the spiritual, but it has everything to do naturally with something that we're being kept from, liberated from, made free from. You know, the scripture talks, I think it's Psalm 139, about how magnificent our bodies were made by the Father. And yet we have people say that, well, you know, God did this. we're just sinners and we're just unholy and we're just incomplete and we came here, you know, unrighteous. And yet the scripture says in Ecclesiastes, what God does is forever. Nothing can add to it or take away from it. And in Ecclesiastes 7, I think it's around verse 29, it says, we were brought here upright upright now, complete, holy, righteous, saved, redeemed, reconciled, yet we sought out many inventions. The New King James says we sought out many schemes, and I will add of religion. We sought out many schemes and lies of religion. But we were brought here, we were knitted in our mother's womb. He paid attention to every little detail he put the blood in our body that works in, in such intricate ways to keep us from disease and from infection and to keep the oxygen flowing and to keep us conscious and to keep our blood sugar levels the way they should be. And as in the natural, so in the spiritual. So this series on the language of the blood the most important thing that I wanted to get across is this. If we can but understand the four Greek words that the translators translated as forgiveness, forgive, remission, and remit, we will understand that God never needed blood to forgive us, to charisma us. We're the ones that needed the blood. Amen. Why? Because we needed more than just to be forgiven of. We needed to be free from anything or everything that would bind us in any way and keep us earthbound, not bearing fruit that remains. So that's the series on the language of the blood. As I said, we're going to continue to add things to this, but we're going to come under another heading or another title, Toxic. We're going to look at Toxic scriptures and we're going to look at toxic texts I guess I'll entitle it and we're going to look at some of these we're going to take this a little bit further but just in a little different way and we're going to look at some scriptures that we have grossly misunderstood 
especially in our religious upbringing. And we're going to see the truth of what the authors were really revealing by the Spirit unto us. And my desire is that the Holy Spirit will just quicken these things more and more within us and that we'll endeavor to walk, keep the garden and walk in the awareness of the truth that he's revealing to us and thereby bear the fruit that remains. No more vacillating, no more like a seesaw, no more up and down. You know, the majority of Christians that I run into and talk to, there's still a lot of vacillating going on. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of seesaw effect. Yes. You know, up one day and down the next. One day I'm saved, next day I'm not sure. A lot of that's still going on. But we need to be a people because, you know, we are the example to the groaning creations, Romans 8 says. They're looking for the manifestation of the sons of God. And we already are Amen. the manifested sons of God. They're already on the scene, and they're revealing the truth and bearing the fruit of love. No more condemning people. Amen. No more being judgmental, but just loving them. Like the cross. What did Jesus do? He opened his arms. He just loved. He loved. No matter what they did and said to him, he just loved. He expressed the love of the Father. He came to expose the lies of religion and to reveal the truth that makes us free, liberates us from anything that would be binding in our life that would cause us to not be able to experience the fullness of who we have always been in him. Father, we thank you tonight for your presence, for your word, for the true teacher, the Holy Spirit. We thank you that the desire of the Spirit within each and every one of us is to lead and guide and direct us into all of the truth and bring back to our remembrance that which we have forgotten. We thank you, Father, for your love and your grace, for revealing yourself unto us in no uncertain terms. And we thank you that as time goes on, the truth is intensifying more and more within each and every one of us. And we're beginning to experience a walk in you that we've never experienced before. We thank you. We praise you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen, amen and amen.